Good morning, everyone. This is Gary Kay, and you are watching a special edition of my Rants and Rays podcast, obviously a video cast today, and I'm joined with Jamie McGraw. Jamie is with Seneca, who's actually owned by Arrow, and Arrow's this giant supplier of electronics parts and pieces and raw components, finished products. And Seneca, is, I guess Seneca as a digital signage company was purchased about eight years ago. Is that right, Jamie? That, that's right, Gary. Yep, exactly. And tell me a little bit about, for those people that don't know Seneca, what's 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 different about Seneca and the other media players out there and sort of how the company is positioned within Arrow? So we're, we're kind of well set up for like um, video handling in general, Gary. So we have in, in our Syracuse environment, we have a lab that's set up where we do um, we do signage for days. We do like content validation, things like that. And I think over the years, as the industry has kind of evolved, that's kind of set us apart, especially when we engage partners in that aside from having like a, a solid device that we can take to market, we also have this sort of subject matter expertise behind the scenes that helps integrators, creators, and really anybody engaged in, in, in sort of that process of deploying a signage project. Um, we engage them directly. We do that testing, we do that validation. We, we literally bake our media players in a thermal chamber, replicating real environments while playing signage and, and actual content back. So I think that sort of validation on the front end has helped kind of separate us a little bit from the pack and what we do where we're, we're more than just a device, you know? Yeah, and I wanna to talk to you about that a little bit later because I, I see uh, obviously the digital science market really not too distant future, really just be calling, be called advertising and just yeah. be a segment of the advertising market. But for now, um, obviously it's not in programmatic and there's a lot of digital uh, content being sent to screens all over the world. And the media player is the key to that in addition to the network, obviously, but there's a lot of different ways you can throw a network together. We have cell, we have uh, Wi-Fi, we have wired connections, and then we also have, you know, custom uh, RF, distribution and satellite distribution right. systems, but you have a brand new player called the Element MP yes. that's uh, quite a bit different. You're going to kind of do a little bit of an unboxing and kind of show us what's different about the player. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first off, I'm, I'm very proud of the effort that my team put into this. This is a year in development. Um, uh -huh. And when you factor that in today's supply chain and ecosystem, um, it, it's, it's been interesting. Right. Yeah, um, <laughs> what's unique about this? So we, we, we sort of look at our product guidance by steering committees. Those are major influencers mm -hmm. in the industry to help guide features and sets. So, um, you know, kind of I'll just kind of show you a little bit here. So when we talk about the product, you know, we definitely went for like a cleaner aesthetic on the platform. Yeah. Right. Just from a unboxing. It's great to have a good device. What's your out of box experience and, and the experience and the way this device is experienced is sort of a linear, right? It starts from the experience that your target audience has. Mm -hmm. When you look at the folks involved and how many different folks have to come together to make a solution go right, that's IT groups, that's uh, content developers, that's integrators. We wanted to make sure that the out-of-box experience on this was as clean as the device. Now, kind of full circle to your point about connectivity and features inside of the box, that's when I kind of look at what we've done to evolve the media player. So what I'm what I'm showing you here, guys, is this is really Gary the the media player as a whole. You'll notice it's it's fanless, right? Yeah, it has a First heat sink all, right on top. That's right, but it's yeah. still it from a profile. It's 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 a one U or one point seven five inch. Okay. When this is mounted behind a display, it has to be in such a way that you're ADA compliant. You're no more than four inches off the wall. So we we made mm -hmm. this as thin as possible. A lot of competitors have very high heat sinks. Yeah. We're able to distribute the thermals appropriately here. From from an I.O., your point exactly. Different means of connectivity. We have LTE connectivity. We have mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. You can even engage with alternate sensors, right? The types of deployments that we're going into, even things like as simple as like a GPIO header on here, mm -hmm. being able to engage. You're talking about programmatic and, and sort of the evolution and, and the various disparities in the signage industry today you're really talking about 
how many different ways can you connect? So, so got, that GPIO, yeah. just so people know, that's that sure. that would give you the ability, for example, to do stuff like if you lift the product off a shelf, have the digital science player trigger content right. to be sent to that shelf, or e even motion sensing and and even oh, yeah. um, and gesture sensing with a GPIO port. That's that's really neat because most digital science players are just players. So that's you're right. doing you're adding all the interactive functionality. So for example, in that case, would that be how you would control uh, an interactive display through that? Or do you have an Could additional be. USB there as well? You do. You have other means of connectivity. It really depends okay. on the display. So like you can engage relays in transportation. Mm -hmm. You can engage sensors. Could be a thermal sensor. Could be motion or or. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, would be like it's bright outside, dim the uh, uh, brighten the displays. It's dim. That's right. It's you're in a dark environment. Lower the the brightness of the displays to preserve. There's a lot of things you could do there, and that's kind of interesting because I used to work for AMX as a control system company. That right. was critical for us to have all these outside. IO capabilities, uh, sort of like trigger points. And it's interesting that you integrated that on the player. I'm curious to what input and output ports and resolution you can support as well. So from an input and output, uh, output we went with HDMI 2.0 proper. Okay. So, you know, when we're talking about the, how you control your displays, the resolution, we want to make sure this device is all about flexibility, Gary. So, you know, we've got the HDMI 2.0, we can manage a 4K, a 2160p, 4K, mm -hmm. 60 frame per second content, high bit rate all day long. But it's you has... have four ports there. So you're doing four yeah. displays at the same time? Oh, yeah. You can all run 4K? Dis... All 4K. Wow. Now, again, it's going to be content dependent. Yeah. What's unique about this device is it, from a processing capability, it scales up from you know, uh, an entry level processor through a higher end. So your bit rate and the type of content is going yeah. to, you know, not all 4K is the same, right? Yeah. But yeah. nonetheless, oh, yeah. You can run four independent displays here um, off of this, or you can merge them into a you know a four by one, a one by four, or whatever your sort of heart's content. Where this is not only able to do similar to what a discrete graphic card would do once upon a time, um, yeah. but you're able to do it in in such a way that you're you don't need a video wall server. You're doing yeah. it again in in a convenient. I'm going to ask you about that in just a second. So you yeah, have yeah. four outputs. And then you obviously have the network. Is that a network in and out a loop through, or is that giving you one gig versus 10 gig? What do you have there as far as your network port? Are you able to send the content through that as well in the, in the case of streaming it H.265 or what are those ports for? So the, and that's, a, this is your general connectivity. These are gigabit uh -huh. ports. Um, okay. the, the flow and functionality here is really dependent on how you set it up. You'll notice like from just across the board, the IO features here. Yeah. It's really about taking the historic media player you'd expect and merging it with what is commonly called like an IoT device. Yeah, yeah. That programmatic merger of those things, this device has got to do more than play video. And and the more we can consolidate devices into a single platform, the better. So to your point, you've got maybe you're using a management port, you're managing your you know your your fleet of devices at a in a retail environment, and then maybe one is pulling in your content. There, there's a number of ways I've seen this used. Um, overwhelmingly, though, we're seeing that merger of: is it a media player? Or is it an IoT device? Right. Um, you know, the operational tech behind it really says it really is a IoT device that plays media. <laughs> and I see that you also have two antenna ports there. Is that for the LTE, or what is that for? Wi-Fi or LTE. You have okay. the option for both. And then we also have further breakouts. So I'll show you kind of here on the side. There's okay. expansion ports as well, where oh. you can add other connectivity. What I, what is I that see a USB C? Often, what is that? Uh, this port? is actually just a, 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 a knockout where you can add additional antenna. Okay. Not oh, everybody okay. wants them. So yeah. it is an option you can add to configure. Reason being, Gary, is sometimes you have drop offs in cellular yeah. or Wi Fi and you need that redundancy for connectivity to go longer distance. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yep. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. And then the four USB ports, uh, are those USB 3? What are those? Yeah, these are USB 3. Um, mm -hmm. These are, you know, generalized connectivity. I, I find yeah. more often than not, you know, these are used during an, a setup process. After mm -hmm. that, it's more than anything. Uh, these re remain unused for the most part. What is the operating system? Uh, Linux-based um, okay. or Windows 10. Um, okay. The, you know, it's an x86 architecture. It's an Intel-based processor. Um, so you can run Windows 10 IoT. 
um, standard Windows or Linux on this device. Um, we sort of have a unique approach to how we sort of put the operating system out on the device. These are appliances, right? These are not yeah. your general PC. So we, we have sort of a custom flavor of Windows 10 IoT that our engineers developed um, that sort of takes this from a, a general sort of purpose operating system and puts it into the realm of being a visual media appliance. Right. Purpose built yep. specifically. That's and, exactly it. And, and then the, is that an RS-232 port over there on the far left? Yeah. Oh and, yeah. Still, yeah. Those are still, <laughs> still, still around, still, still chugging. That's right. And you have an internal power supply. It looks like, cause I see ground there as well. Is that right? We do. We do. Okay. So this device, it's an internal power supply for instances where, um, you may not want to or be able to hang a brick behind mm -hmm. the system. It's just your standard AC. What's unique about this platform is this is modular. There's you can get this system where basically your chassis cuts off here. Okay. And now you can use a DC brick. Okay. Often used in kiosks where you're running Multiple maybe running DC bricks, yeah, yeah. That's okay. exactly it. Yep. Yeah. And so so let me ask you a question. Um with I, I don't know the I mean obviously you have a CMS incorporated into this clearly. Uh, you're going to have a CMS incorporated to this. But what about um, video content manipulation? Like, for example, could I could I put that in a classroom to be a um, video server in a way or a media player for a classroom where I'm able to connect my laptop and send content, but also it switch over to be a digital signage system in between classes, for example? Absolutely. That's that's a great question. So. In the front here, you'll see I have audio, and then there's mm -hmm. another panel that is optioned out where you can do an HDMI capture. Okay. The reason being is distance learning and, and also classroom-based yeah. media, you have the ability to pull in an HDMI feed and then also replicate your signage over the top of it, depending right. on the CMS that you're yeah. using. And that's right? what I was going to ask you. Is can it, so can it switch like automatically whenever the sees no signal present? The HDMI signals removed. It'll switch to the digital signage content and vice. That's exactly so, it. So, so you order that MP as an option with HDMI as an input, or how do I order that that way? You would order it as an H with an HDMI input. So what okay. we're able to do is we're able to, and it's HDCP compliant. Right. So yeah. in that in that lens, you can pull in. You're not capturing it. You're passing right. through. So in yeah. that regard, you you wouldn't be capturing a recording. That's the, that's a yeah. no no. But what you can do is take that content in pass it through through your displays and, and as your soon CMS as you disconnected it switches to the to the uh, to the to the digital signage content so is that exactly. a one up application meaning can i mix the digital signage content with the hdmi that's being passed through is that possible you can absolutely so you can mix your content and again it's going to be cms dependent all different cmss have different capabilities with how they're able to function i'll give you an example like and i won't I'll, I'll be agnostic on the CMS side, but yeah. if I were uh, wanted to do digital signage at a at a sports bar, right. and maybe I wanted to pull in the game, right. show it on my, you know, maybe I've got four screens and I wanted to show it, but I also wanted a ticker across the bottom that I have, you know, dollar wings and you know yeah. discounted drafts of Guinness or whatever. Um, I have the capability to do that and run signage across the top of it. Right. Yep. Right. And then if it goes down, theoretically, you could have a backup of pulling that content off the internet too, uh, if you had Absolutely. subscriptions to it. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. So yeah. obviously you've got over 20 years of experience in this industry. I'm, I'm curious what you see is, because for me, being an, a professor of advertising, I see this as the future of advertising, right? But I'm curious what you see in the immediate future for the digital signage market or signage industry in general. Like what's sort of like, where do you see us two years from now, maybe five years from now? So it, it's it's interesting. We're we're evolving as an industry, and you're and you're spot on about that. The advertising piece, right? We're mm -hmm. we're evolving as an industry almost faster than we can keep up from a maturation stance, mm -hmm. right? So when you consider signage, we don't quite have the industry standards like line. There yeah. is a disparity. I mean, yeah. you know, integrator to integrator, best practice to best practice. But if you follow the money, and that's that's where the ad networks are. Right. And yeah. that's where that programmatic out of home and really that digital out of home footprint that is sort of leading the charge and setting those. And behind it, you'll have the mom and pop shops and the conventional informational stuff. Ad networks are leading the charge on that. So right. where where do I see the industry in two years and five years? In, in two years, I, I see us sort of adopting some standardization, much overdue, long needed. Um, 
and I also see the evolution of sort of the path that the element's going. It's it's not these are not just media players. These are becoming sophisticated devices that are doing more than the the content push is actually usually like more ancillary than anything. I'm right. going to layer analytics over it. I'm going to yield glean insights from that information. I'm going to do programmatic triggers of content. And when we start getting into experiential um, sort of right. what folks, and that's the crux, right? Folks are going to look at the industry as a whole and, and a digital signage installation from the outside in. Let's start with what do we want the experience to be? What do we want the folks who are our impressions to experience? And then we back into it from there. And I think too often, probably to a flaw, signage is installed like, yeah, we're going to do signage. It's going to look really yeah. cool. And this is going to be awesome. But the factoring of, okay, but like, why? Why are we yeah. doing signage here? What, 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 what do we want to yield from this installation other than we have some digital displays? So I think that's the big crux in, in the next two years, we'll see people looking outside in from the experience. Yeah, and I think what's happened with a lot of these digital signage installs that have been dominated by AV companies is that you they're interesting the first three or four months they're in and then people stop, the no, stop <laughs> noticing right. them that's because right. they're not experiential. Like why not use the, all the screens that are all over the classrooms and buildings and and spaces that are there now and then turn those into experiences or focus on experiences from the beginning right rather right. than just content players but but that's uh, right i i tend to agree with you but i do think that this is going to explode when we get to programmatic right that ad networks they 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 are they're good with digital science but until they're programmatic meaning the whole cms platform is programmatic then it's right it's never going to explode and there's so much money out there because we've gone from 65% of our ad spend globally on television advertising down to 45%, which means there's right. a lot of money going somewhere. And I think signage is, is a great opportunity for that. Um, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. So if you're an AV company or you're a, a you know, consumer integrator, let's say you do high-end residential and you're kind of looking at this resi virtual market and you're getting asked about digital signage or you're not completely in digital signage, what advice would you give them to get into digital signage? You know, how would you start? And where would you go? I mean, obviously they should check out Seneca. <laughs> I would say, I was going to say, you know, it, definitely said check out Seneca. It, it's really about partnerships, right? So mm -hmm. I see all too often that they're looking at mounts and screens and cables and this and, and, but they're not factoring in what's my CMS and, and, and what do I want to have from that experience? And what's the device? I, I find often the CMS in the, device and the hardware is often like the last thing that's looked at. And then we're trying to cram with whatever's left out of that budget. And I would say to like any AV integrator out there that's touching on signage today, start from the experience and have a good fleet of um, partners. And that there's so many things that come to make it all come together. There's the display manufacturers, the mount manufacturers, cabling, networking, the content management, the content creation team, the ex maybe you have a firm who's consulting on doing the experience in the install um, as a consultant or whatever, it, pulling the right folks in and having a good Rolodex. I almost look at it like a general contractor who builds homes. You've got to have a reliable electrician, a reliable sheetrock person, insulation folks, roofing, and you don't just hunt through the yellow pages and pick someone because ultimately your reputation's at stake when you're a general contractor. And I would say yeah. the same to the AV folks. It's your reputation. Have a good, concise list of partners all the way from the content down to the last nut and bolt. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And you can find out more about Seneca at SenecaData.com, S-E-N-E-C-A-D-A-T-A.com. That's where you can see the Elements series. This is a brand new product in the element series called the MP. Hold that up again, if you don't mind. And yeah. by the way, I, th I think, Jamie, when we will know that digital science is about to explode, I mean, it's already growing rapidly. I mean, we already still, it's a double digit growth market every year, but right? when we're yeah. going to see explosive growth is when the trade desks, their little, tra their little training videos on how to do programmatic ma media buying, when they do one on digital signage, you know, we've hit the big time. That's right. <laughs> I guess That's I'm right. kind of watching the trade desk. But anyway, uh, thank, Jamie, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Don't forget the Seneca is part of Arrow. 
Uh, I don't know if they're still called Aero Electronics or they're yep. now just Aero, yep. yeah. Aero Electronics. Yep. Yeah, I remember that uh, they were the first and only company you could buy way back when, 19, late 1980s, IBM PS2 15 pin high density connectors from. They, they basically owned the market for, for those connectors years and years and years ago. So uh, they've got a long history of connectivity in the industry. Jamie, they thank do. you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And I appreciate y'all joining me for this uh, launch, this uh, special Rants and Raves. This is a special edition of my Rants and Raves. We're, we're kind of doing a deep dive into a product and uh, all about digital science. So two of my favorite things. I want to thank everyone for watching. And uh, Jamie, you have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Ray, Ray, Ray. With Ray.